Uh, welcome and thank you for being here and caring about uh, caring about our veterans, caring about our military members and their families. It's uh, you're doing this is really exciting to me and seeing how many of you are really interested in what we are doing. I'm going to give you like a real blanket approach to uh, to culture. Uh, I, I was driving along in the car one day and there was a debate on the radio, and the premise of the debate was can women make good managers? And as soon as I heard that, I was angry. Because, I, I mean, yes, and no. <laughs> and do men make good managers? Yes, and no, because it's really up to the individual. So we can talk about, in general, what are female characteristics, in general, what are male characteristics, but they are not going to apply to each individual because we are all individuals. And it's the same thing with military culture. Uh, we, we have certain things that connect us together and certain things that make us similar to each other, but we are also individuals. And so we also have different characteristics and different things that, uh, that we do. So I'm just gonna give you a real basic idea of it. I'm not gonna tell you what, every, I mean, we even have subcultures within the military and we tease each other and make fun of each other in the, in the various services. So, um, Understand that this is just a generalized thing. The other thing I'm going to talk to you about before we get going, and this still applies, uh, it, but not as much so as it used to, are uh, Vietnam era veterans and prior. Many of them joined uh, because they were drafted. Uh, they did not join uh, willingly. Well, they served their country and they did their honor the honorable thing, but they were not cut out of the same fabric. Now, some of those adopted our characteristics, others did not. And so when you are talking to somebody who's 65 or older, and I know that that's not necessarily the pool that you're most normally looking at, but when you are dealing with folks that are 65 and older, you're gonna find that maybe they don't fit in this mold a little bit, or if you know somebody who's, who is that. So I just give that caveat. But also understand that after 1973, everybody who puts on the uniform of this country has done so voluntarily. So it's not, we are not doing so uh, against our will, we're doing it because we actually like it, at least going in. <laughs> Once there, sometimes that changes. Uh, slide, please. I, I do have to, and that's not forwarding, is it? All right, well, the next slide that you would have seen if it was working is a disclaimer, and what I have to tell you, and this is what the, our military lawyers tell me, is I have to tell you that the Views expressed here are not those of the United States government. They are not the views of the United States Army or of the main Army National Guard, and therefore it'll be much more interesting. Um, <laughs> what we're gonna talk about today is it's kind of broken down into, well, I, normally what I do is I give you kind of an overview, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, resources, then I'll talk a little bit about statistics. We alter that a little bit for you folks as employers because um, what, what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, show you one of the, all the many, many reasons why it is a good idea to hire a military, uh, a military person or a former military person. Qu just quickly, how many of you in here have served in the military? Okay, so, um, you know, Otto uh, already stole my joke about slowing it down for certain services, but uh, I will, t oh, for those of you who are in the military, just so you know, um, if, you, if you're in the Army, the latrine is down the hall and after the stairs and to the left. If you're in the Navy, the Marine Corps, or the Coast Guard, the head is down the hall and down the stairs and to the left. And if you're in the Air Force, uh, I'm sorry, we couldn't afford a hotel room. Uh, so, <laughs> had to get you back at some point during the day. Um, okay, now we're way ahead. Uh, let's, you can go to the next one, because I just told them what the agenda was. Okay, and I, you know, this is coming up kind of small up here, so, and, and actually, I don't think we've gone to the full slideshow. We, we, okay, all right. Really, there are, uh, these are the branches that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, for the most part, Army is the land forces, the Navy is the ocean-going forces, and the Air Force obviously operates predominantly in the air. Uh, the Marine Corps actually do all three. Uh, they, they, they go, they have their own uh, uh, pilots, they have their own uh, seagoing guys, and they have their uh, own infantry type guys. So they, they, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force have elite forces. 
You might have heard of the SEALs, the Delta Force, or Air Force Rescue. But frankly, the Marine Corps is a, uh, an elite force. Uh, it, it really is a, a higher level. It's tougher to get through. Uh, it's very, they're, they're really good. And don't tell any of them that I said that. Um, <laughs> technically, the Marine Corps are part of the Navy. And uh, they don't like to admit that, but it's still true. They get their chaplains and some of their lawyers from, uh, from the Navy. And so uh, they still fall under the Secretariat of the Navy. The Coast Guard is actually not part of the Department of Defense. Does anyone know who they are part of? Pre or post 9-11? Well, now. <laughs> Department of Homeland Security. Homeland Security. Do you know what they were a part of before that? Yes. Department of Transportation. Department of Transportation. Do you know why? Revenue. Exactly. What? Are you in the Coast Guard? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I can't read. I just, I'm in the Army. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, exactly right. Uh, believe it or not, there was a time before uh, now where there was no federal income taxes. And the way that we raised money was through tariffs of import goods. And the Coast Guard was created to make sure that the bad guys didn't smuggle the stuff in. That being said, in times of war or conflict, very often the Coast Guard is used by the Department of Defense. And I'll give you a prime example. In Vietnam, uh, the Coast Guard actually brought those elite forces that I just talked about, they brought them up those rivers and dropped them off at different places and had firefights. So their culture is very similar to us, their benefits are very similar, and as you'll see, well, I, I don't actually put up the Coast Guard ranks, they're the same ranks and the same grades as, as the Navy. So we include them in this discussion too because they're our brothers and sisters as well, even if they happen to be from a different uh, secretariat. So, next slide please. Active National Guard Reserves. Active for our purposes, we're just gonna say that those are the folks who do it every single day. They operate on a base or a post, it's the same thing. Army, we call it a post, the, Marine, uh, the uh, Navy and Air call it a base, uh, Coast Guard calls it a base. Uh, that's just so we can confuse each other. Um, but that, every, pretty much everything that they do revolves around that base or post. Everything that their family does revolves around that base or post. That's where they do their clothes shopping. That's where they do their grocery shopping. That's where they get their physical health. That's where they get their behavioral health. That's where they worship if they choose to do so. So everything is based on, on that. They are federal forces, Title 10 U.S. Code. All right? The reserve components, and this gets a little confusing because reserve components is the generic term for those of us who serve part-time. But then you also see reserves down here, so that makes it kind of confusing. The reserves are part of the reserve components and the National Guard is part of the reserve components, but we are separate animals. The thing that we have in common is that we generally uh, drill uh, or operate militarily 39 days a year. Uh, one weekend a month, uh, 15 days a year. We have basically the same schedule and there are exceptions, but that's not important to you. The point is that we're part-time and full-time, we work in your world. And that's what we have in common. What we don't have in common is that the reserves are actually Title X U.S. Code, just like the active forces are. They are federal. Their commander-in-chief is the President of the United States. In the National Guard, my commander-in-chief is the Governor of the State of Maine. Because I am on Title 32 U.S. Code. It's a separate part of the U.S. Code. And we are state-oriented. Uh, some of you may have seen our Adjutant General speak this morning. He is in command of the guard forces in Maine as operated, as appointed by the governor of the state of Maine. He has the rank and the authority to tell the guard what to do. We also have a Marine Corps Reserve uh, unit in Maine. We have a couple of Navy Reserve units in Maine. We have a Coast Guard active, Coast Guard Reserve. We actually have some active duty Navy guys down at Bath uh, Ironworks right now. All of those guys although they have to salute him and say, sir, uh, he has no authority over them. Their authorities are actually outside of the state. So when they look for services and administrative support and all that stuff, they're not getting it from within the state. And so that becomes much more complex. But I will tell you this, our previous governor and our current governor, our previous adjutants general and our current adjutant general has given us the instruction that even though the National Guard pays us, and even though that's who, that's who we technically work for, we're supposed to support everybody. And that's why we call it Fort Maine. 
Instead of calling it like Fort Jackson or Fort whatever, we are Fort Maine. And we provide all those services and you provide all those services up to and including employing our military members during, during the month, okay? So that's the basic differences. Uh, next slide, please. This is, a, this is very important and you may not realize why. My gut feeling is those of you who are not in the military or never been in the military, your tendency is probably to say that anybody who's wearing the uniform or did wear the uniform is a veteran. And we use that as, you know, as a common term, uh, veteran, and it just refers to all military forces. This is not accurate in terms of benefits. Uh, the, there are different organizations that have different uh, echelons of what, is, what uh, a person who has served in the military uh, is eligible for. And if you notice, I asked the question, how many of you have served in the military? I didn't ask how many of you are veterans. A lot of our folks out there don't self-identify as veterans. Maybe they were in for six years. Maybe they were in for 12 years. Uh, maybe they did 20 years in the National Guard but did not, uh, uh, but did not ever serve overseas. And when they went to the Veterans Administration and said, hey, I'm, I'm retired, I want to take part in this, they said, well, you don't qualify. Oh, well, I don't qualify for that. So then when we have a job fair for veterans, some of those folks say, oh, well, I, I, I can't go to VA, so I probably am not eligible for that. So it's internal to us that we think that sometimes we can't do it, and it's also internal to you sometimes. So remember when you use the term veteran, that it's, it, it, for some people, it is a, um, a term that cuts off a lot of possibilities. So what we ask is when a person is signing up or if you have a, a job application, have you ever served in the military? Completely different question. Because my gut feeling is that the folks that are here right now and, all, and what you want to do, um, you want to help everybody who ever served in, the, in, in uniform, as long as they had an honorable discharge and didn't have any problems. And oh, by the way, 70% uh, right now, today, even though we've had these two big wars that have been going on, 70% of the main Army National Guard has not deployed to a, com to a combat zone. So technically they are not veterans, yet they're still serving and they could be working for you. So the question is, have you ever served in military forces? That's a much better question to ask on your applications. Uh, I mentioned VA, uh, and I'm not going to go into the, the depth because we also use this briefing for folks that uh, actually deal with the other side of the house, the, the folks that need support. So we just put these things out, VA, um, and we talk about health care and TRICARE. National Guardsmen and reservists used to not be eligible for TRICARE. TRICARE is the military insurance that does indeed cover their families as well as the service member. Uh, we have to purchase it. On active duty, they get it for free. And for their whole family, it's free. And you're going to see why that's important to you in just a minute. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to go very quickly through the ranks. Uh, honestly, a lot of people think that this is their favorite part, and, and it's my least favorite, but that's OK. Um, the re we break it down to really to three categories. I've got four up there. But we have the enlisted ranks, which are enlisted and non-commissioned officers. We have the warrant officers, and then we have commissioned officers. We call them different things in the different services. And so very often when you're talking to a military member, they will refer to themselves by their pay grade as opposed to what their actually rank is. They might say, oh, yeah, I'm an E5, or uh, I'm, I'm an E8, or I'm an O1, or something like that, because we are aware that it doesn't always translate. And sometimes we connect ourselves with our pay grade rather than uh, what our actual rank is called. I, I, well, we'll go through these individually, so we'll go through them. E1 to E4, and here's a perfect example. An E2, in the Army we say that's a private E2. In the Navy they say it's a seaman apprentice, and, a, and the Coast Guard as well. In the Airmen they would call that, uh, in the Air, Air Force they would call it an Airman, and in the Marine Corps it's a private first class. So you see we call it different things, but they all get paid the same thing. Now, uh, I think like, and there are bonuses, like if, you're a, if you work on a nuclear reactor, they give you a bonus or something like that, and I guess it's so you don't glow at night. But um, th so, that, so these folks right here, these are basically entry level. When I say that, and we're going to talk a little bit about the intelligence and the, and the experience of the, of the military member, when I say that, these people are already way ahead of the average person, uh, of, of their contemporaries. These folks are generally, generally, 18 to 24, might be married, 
might have a, a child or two. Um, they have already, by the time they get to E4, they know their job. They've probably already been working at their job for quite some time. So if you do have one of these people applying, you've got somebody who's already trained, somebody who already knows what they're doing, somebody who has already been uh, at a higher level than their contemporaries. I usually mention this later, but I'll mention it right now. When you are 17 or 18, when you're 17 or 18 and you join the military, just think in your mind of a person graduating high school. 17 or 18, you're going to walk in there, and within about three weeks, that drill sergeant who's been yelling at you is going to pick you out and is going to say, you, you're in charge of him and her. You've got to make sure that they get here on time, that they are fed properly, that they have the right uniform, and that they're ready for the training day. Got it? About a week later, she will be fired, and then I will hire him, and he will do the same thing. Because we teach leadership from the day they, they walk through the door. The next week, I'm going to pick you. And I'm going to say, here, I want you to, here's a manual of the, of, of, the, of the arms of the United States Army. I want you to read pages 574 to 578, and you are going to give a briefing on that tomorrow morning. Got it? That's what you're getting when you get a person who's just an E4. <laughs> They've already gone through that. They've already been trained in that. They already know how to lead other people and how to support other people and care about other people and ensure that those people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. They've already learned it. And they are only 19 or 20 years old. It's good stuff. Uh, go to the next slide. I wanted, we wanted to point, this is something special that we do for you folks because this has been asked. This is what they make. And I, for those of you in the back, our E1, that's entry level. I mean, this is what you, where you start at if you don't have any college. They're making about 18 grand, well, closer to 19 grand a year. Once they get to E4 and have a little bit of tenure, they're making close to $30,000 a year. $30,000 a year. One of the issues that we have is when they come off of active duty, or if let's say they only stayed in six years and they decided this wasn't for them, and they come out there in E4, they're making $30,000 already, and that's bumping up against what a lot of us pay. Let me add something. They also get a housing allowance, which is tax-free. They also get a sustenance allowance, which is tax-free. And as I mentioned before, they get insurance not only for themselves, but for their whole family. So that package of 30000 is really worth at least 45000 And they also are uh, getting points in the, in the guard. Uh, they are getting... Um, years of, of served towards a retirement if they do indeed stay in. So that's what you're up against. <laughs> and that's why one of the reasons why we have some trouble getting some military members to apply for these jobs that are paying $12, $13 an hour. And oh, by the way, you have to buy your own insurance. And oh, by the way, and oh, by the way. So the approach that we suggest you do is, yeah, you tell them what it is, but you show them what their pathway can be to, to moving up in your, in your company. It's very important. And, and by the way, we have a tendency, and I'm not into the culture piece yet, but we have a tendency to be very linear thinkers. If you start giving us a, a menu of about five different things about you can go, you're just going to get a blank face. But if you say, hey, get this done, and here's what's going to happen in six months. Get that done, and here's what's going to happen in a year from now. That's a great way to hire somebody who you believe, believe, believe me, you're going to want to have. All right, next slide. These are our non-commissioned officers. Uh, E5, a sergeant in the Army, pe uh, petty officer, second class in the Navy, staff sergeant in the Air, sergeant uh, like us in the Marines. This person, that's the last rank that you can achieve basically by just keeping your nose clean and doing your job. After that, when you get to an E6 or an E7, you are talking about a person who has, been, who has competed against others, has increased uh, levels of responsibility. By the time you get to E7, and you have to remember that the Army and the Marine Corps are, are more people focused, and the Air Guard, uh, I'm sorry, the Air Force and the Navy are, have a, a lot of technology that we don't necessarily have. And so it's not that you know, it, there's any difference there, other than you have to think about the level of competence of this person. And when they get to E7, you're talking about a highly competent person who's been responsible for about 60 people or the commensurate amount of people and technology. 
All right. So that's so when you, if a person comes through the door and is applying for your job and saying that they were an E7 in the military, that's very. And if they say they were an E7 in the Marine Corps, uh, that's called a gunnery sergeant. You might have heard gunny if you've watched uh, enough uh, war movies. Um, the Marine Corps has their own nickname for the gunnery sergeant. You know what it is? God. <laughs> because when you get to that level, the Marine Corps is much smaller than the other services, and so obviously the competition gets more. And so it gets, the, the pyramid gets real thin real quick. So if you're, an e if you're talking to an E7 from the Marine Corps, you're talk and actually if you're talking to any E7, you're talking to a very highly qualified person, but the Marine Corps especially. Next slide, please. Here's what they make. Uh, st the E5 starts at about 26500 You get to the end of the line at, as an E7, you, this person's making about $61,000 a year. And oh, by the way, they're still getting the housing allowance, and they're still getting the sustenance allowance, and they're still getting their whole family uh, health care paid for. So think about that when you're talking to that person. If you can't offer them this much, you have to offer them something else. Meaningful employment, a meaningful job. A lot of times what happens, we go over and we're given literally hundreds of millions of dollars worth of equipment to be accountable for. And then we come over here and sometimes you get into a job where you have to ask permission to go to the bathroom. It's pretty tough to go from one to the other. I was trusted with this then, I'm not even trusted with this now. So it's very important to remember the mindset of the person that you're talking to, particularly when they get into the senior ranks. You go to the next slide. These are uh, uh, first sergeants and, um, and, uh, master, and uh, sergeants major. And it, that is how you say it, sergeants major. They are sergeants who are major, not majors who are sergeant. Uh, so that is the correct term. Sergeants major are the highest level of, and first sergeants are the highest at their particular level of the military. These people are of the highest quality. And they are very responsible for anywhere from, well, in the case of sub-sergeants major, uh, they're responsible for literally, sergeant major of a division is responsible for about 15,000 people. And making sure that all of the other sergeants major in the chain are taking care of their people. Uh, when you're talking about a first sergeant, you're talking about somebody who's responsible for at least 150 people and their families and everything else that goes on in their lives. So when that person is sitting in front of you, if they say they're an E8 or an E9, a lot of them have uh, associate's degrees, some, even, some have bachelor's degrees. The Sergeant Major Academy that they have to go to, which is a military school, it has been said that that is the, roughly the equivalent of an associate's degree on its own. The only difference is that uh, when you're getting an associate's degree in the civilian world, you don't have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and run seven miles. Okay? So next, next slide, please. Uh, these folks... Uh, make up to 90, 